everyone, and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Natasha Martinez, and this is the daily show where we give you all the latest news in the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us today is Christian Harloff. Uh, what's going on, guys? Welcome back to Collider Movie Talk. Natasha, that is a wonderful, wonderful shirt you have on. Thank you. <laughs> and you gave our, it to me. <laughs> I, I did. I thought you got it on your own. And next to me, with being, we're going to introduce her in just a bit. One of the worst tasting movies when I saw her office uh -oh. with movie posters. We'll get yeah. into that in a little bit. Uh-oh. We got Mr. Mark Ellis joining us. I want to hear about this horrible taste in movie posters. Yeah. If anybody has worse taste in movie posters than me, who has a hard target poster in his room right now, I want to hear about it. <laughs> <laughs> and the lovely Perry Nemiroff joining this, us. This is what happens when you win the Oscar pool and people are such sore losers. They hang crappy <laughs> posters in your office. I didn't participate <laughs> in the Oscar pool. You happen to have a, a Transformers poster, Transformers 4 Hate. More power to you. You love that movie as well as there's a Freddy Got Fingered poster in there. There's all these weird posters. So, <laughs> hey, more power to you. Freddy, I didn't know they made Freddy Got Fingered posters. It was the only one. <laughs> she stole the only one. <laughs> right. Hate is going to hate. Yeah, what's going on in the world of movies? movies today. The long-awaited return of the Ghostbusters in rebooted form is finally here. This morning, Sony Pictures released their first trailer for director Paul Feig's spin on the supernatural comedy led by the all-star female cast of Melissa McCarthy, Kristen Wiig, Kate McKinnon, Leslie Jones, with Chris, Chris Hemsworth. Ghostbusters will hit theaters this summer, July 15th. Christian, thoughts on the first trailer for Ghostbusters? Well, it's funny, though, too, because like we told you guys, one of the new things we're going to be doing here at Collider are the trailer reaction and reviews we did one for there was one for ice age there was one yesterday for finding dory and today mark and myself we waited and we went and we watched the ghostbusters trailer and man ugh, this is a bad trailer man this is a bad bad trailer i went into this trailer saying okay i'm not i and i've said this I'm a Paul Feig fan. I like the girls that he got here. I always said that I wish that it would have been more of a continuation than, than a reboot. They start the trailer making you seem like it almost is a continuation, which it clearly isn't once you get into the trailer. So they're misleading you to start. That's not good. I just thought for what they needed to do with this first trailer as far as being a standalone movie, uh, it, it was a weird way to hit it even for the people who say it was okay that's not how you want to hit you want it to be really funny the first movie had elements the 84 version had elements of horror in it in the beginning it was a little scary in the very beginning but it was a real story even though it had some comedy in it and ridiculousness with the stay puff marshall marshmallow man there was a, it felt like a real story of real characters this just felt like a bits it felt shtick it didn't feel if it, it just felt like kind of a silly comedy with the like I, I had said to you in the trailer reaction that it's like when you go to universal studios and they say hey you can be a ghostbuster sign on up and you can watch your video for 15 minutes and that seems like what it was it just seems like joke after your joke, shtick, 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 shtick. It, I really dislike this trailer a lot. How'd you feel about it? First of all, is that a real thing at Universal? I'll go later today. I've so. always to wanted be. to be a Ghostbuster. I've loved this franchise since I first saw it, whenever that was. And so seeing this new trailer, I was very excited for it. Christian, I did not love this trailer. I was also not disappointed by the trailer. I think it's very unfair. Yes, you can compare it to the original Ghostbusters. But when you talk about all the greatness that is that first Ghostbusters, it's got horror. It's got a lot of comedy. It's got a great storyline you're following. It's hard to take all of that and say, well, this trailer wasn't that. Like, we still don't know a lot about this movie. We got a minute and a half of some comedy bits, some of which worked, some of which didn't, and actually gave me some pause about the future of the movie. But having said all that, there was a lot of stuff that I liked in here. I liked watching the way that the women interacted with each other. I liked seeing Slimer. You know I love seeing that Slimer. That was the best part of the whole trailer. I was trailer. hoping yeah. to see somebody I knew, but I didn't want to see one of the original Ghostbusters because I thought that would be getting too nostalgic and tugging on our heartstrings in a way that's not doing the new movie a favor. So in that vein... I was very surprised the way this trailer opened. Okay. I, was, I was very shocked that it was uh, 30 years ago. And I'm like, wait a minute. We've been reporting on this damn show for months. That right. It is not a continuation of the franchise. Right. So why are you, like, if I was just watching this trailer, right? I'm just some yokel, and I'm watching this trailer, and I'm like, oh, sweet. It's a sequel. But it's not. So I didn't like that it sold it as a different bill of goods than what the movie's actually going to be. But having said all that, it's a small complaint when I did enjoy watching the trailer. 
I think that's actually my biggest complaint is why would you do that and then not address it in the rest of the trailer? But I definitely didn't hate this trailer. In fact, I was loving it in the first 10 seconds when you get like the slow form of the theme song. I got chills. I thought I was returning to this franchise the way I wanted to. And then all of a sudden you cut to the actual footage from the film and it's a whole bunch of like, I loved the movie Spy, but I'm not a big fan of Melissa McCarthy pre-Spy for the most part, maybe not the heat, but it was all that kind of humor and it all fell so flat. And then there were all those issues with them throwing back to the original movie and it's kind of like look what we can do here and I don't really know who this movie is for at this point because it's going to rub fans the wrong way and this isn't a first trailer that would introduce this world to newcomers even so I don't really know what they're going for and then we also have the issue of the CGI I like as as a horror fan i'm constantly watching movies and assessing a cgi ghost based on how real it looks and how much it scares me so i really do like the opportunity to step back and kind of have you know big bold designs and crazy colors but nowadays i mean are are people going to go for that especially people who don't know the original film yeah and i think that look i'm very aware that this is just a first trailer and a teaser trailer at that so this movie is i wasn't really excited for spy at all and i i really wound up enjoying spy i thought the red band trailer was really good but the first thing i saw it was like that's okay and i like i said for me paul feig is a guy i'm going to give the benefit of the doubt but being a Ghostbusters fan, and that's who you need to capture. You have to capture the nostalgic fans. You have to do that, and you have to say, okay, this is a remake that I, I really want to see. Yes, standalone fans will, will go out and see people who don't really care about the first one. If they like Melissa McCarthy, they like Kristen Wiig, you'll get them out to see it because they're comedy stars, and that's a good team. But that's not going to give you the kind of success that you want to have if you want to, A, do a franchise, or, or B, really want this thing to be a summer blockbuster comedy. I know it's a first trailer. I get it. I'm just saying for me, the more and more I think about it, I think that this first trailer is garbage. I just think it's, also- it, it spread itself too thin, I think is the biggest complaint I have, because it tried to go for both the nostalgic fans like us and try to get a boatload of new people on board. But I think if you are new to the Ghostbusters universe, I think you, you probably like this trailer, because you did get to see these four comedy stars that we are fans of and look the effects are they like they're, they're it's not meant to be like a straight up horror they're not trying to scare us they're trying to throw a lot of bright colors and entertain us I like the way that ghost looked in the first scene and she pukes all over Kristen Wiig I thought that was funny I, I enjoyed watching this trailer for the most part all right how about you guys what did you guys think about the Ghostbusters trailer I know that you have been putting your thoughts out there right now did you think that it was good did you think you do you still have hope for it or did you think that it stinks Co- make sure that you comment not only in the live chat right now but it when this goes up make sure you do it there natasha what did you think about the trailer you you saw it um this is how i felt just meh like none of the (laughs) jokes were really that funny i did like the opening ghost i was like oh that's cool and i kind of like my interest was sparked but i think the best part of this movie is just going to be chris hemsworth and that's about it (laughs) did you sorry melissa mccarthy have you seen the original (laughs) yes oh you have seen the original were you a fan of it such a huge fan, okay. yeah. Okay, so interesting. We'll, it'll be interesting. To All see. right, what's next? The Suicide Squad team of director and star David Ayer and Will Smith are looking to reunite for their next project. Deadline is reporting that Ayer and Smith are teaming up for the Max Landis written Bright along with Joel Egerton, who is also in talks to star. While plot details are still under wraps, sources at Variety have said that Bright will be in the vein of End of Watch with orcs and fairies living among humans. No release date has been set. Mark, what are your thoughts on Bright with Ayer, Smith, and Egerton starring? All right, so we got End of Watch. That's the tone we're going for. Then we're going to toss some orcs in there, some fairies in there. Okay, but then you throw me David Ayer and Will Smith. I'm like, yeah, I'm totally on board for this movie. Plus, the addition of Max Landis writing a premise like this. If there's somebody that can take an idea that sounds as far out as this concept is and mold it into something that's really exciting and fresh to watch, I think Max Landis would be one of those guys. If you throw Joel Edgerton in there, I'm only more on board. So while the premise isn't necessarily something that I would be lining up to see, you throw it at me, you give me that talent. I think this is a good call. I'm with you, man. I and I, I think that you could if you hear this and you don't know who's involved, you're like, what the hell are they talking about? It kinda of reminded me of that show, the Once Upon a Time, they do things similar to this, and it's like, is it gonna be campy? Who's in this movie? Why are they doing this movie? And then you hear David Ayers doing it, and then you hear End of Watch, and then you hear Will Smith and Joel Edgerton, you go okay, wait a minute, this could be a lot of fun. And then you also with Max Landis, you know it's gonna be off the wall, it's gonna be pretty crazy. Is there a potential this thing could be an absolute 
disaster? Sure. Bec- but I also think that let's let's see for what we've seen so far, Suicide Squad looks pretty incredible. At least I think it does. And and I really loved Fury. I was surprised. I didn't know what Fury was going to be. And I went up seeing that movie, really enjoyed it. So I want to see this take. It might be a little dark. It, it's, it's another fantasy movie and another take on a fantasy realm. I'm always welcome. More fantasy. Give me more fantasy. And how can you how can you deliver on it? So I like the sound of this. My first reaction to this was yay because I was assessing it based on Suicide Squad. Like these two guys liked working together. So that means that movie must be good. But then I kind of looked into this a little more. And the part that throws me off a little is the comparison to End of Watch because I hear a premise like this and I kind of want something like zany and out of control like Hansel and Gretel Witch Hunters, which I did like. <laughs> but then you think End of Watch and it's like, is he going to take a super serious spin on this? Because that doesn't sound like it's going to work very well. So I just kind of hope we don't fall into the trap of getting something along the lines of R.I.P.D. But but R.I.P.D. was trying to be the next Men in Black. And if you can go back to that first Men in Black tone where Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones more so took their characters so seriously in a crazy world that was around them, that's what it sounds like to hear. If it's orcs and fairies and everything's going mad, but you just have these like two cops that are like working a beat and they got to deal with all this crazy stuff, I think it could be fun. Yeah, I'm going to go on the other side of that because I actually, I would prefer it go more serious if David Ayer's doing it because if he starts going to try to do more more like the campy kind of fun stuff then then that's out of his wheelhouse so for that's why when you tell me that he's the one that's doing it and the fact that he did end a watch uh, i believe right then he, mm-hmm. he directed it a watch mm-hmm. as well too so to see so that he's familiar with it there's obviously a reason why he wants to do it he responded to Max's um, script, so that's why I think it could be interesting with that crew attached. Landis is the wild card here. Yeah. He's going to determine which way it goes, and like based on his previous films, it could really go one way or the other. Now that I'm thinking about it, the end of Watch connection could point to Chronicle and maybe something along those lines, and I guess something in that vein would be okay. But you know, did you did you guys see Victor Frankenstein? I, I didn't hate yeah, Victor but, Frankenstein, and I'll also tell you this, is that Chronicle was also found footage. And so if you go like End of Watch, which was mm-hmm. like that one kind of, you know, camera for the most part, it's like, this is, a, I like that idea with the fantasy world. But wait a minute also, though, too, because you can't, Max Landis, yes, he adds his stamp to it, and you know it's a Max Landis script, but the difference, too, between, I don't know who directed that Frankenstein movie, I forgot, but then you also have Josh Trank take away the Fantastic Four thing, did an amazing job directing that movie. So you're talking about the directors too. Landis will have say as far as what happens on the page, but it's the director who's Mm going to make it seem what it is. And David Ayer is a guy who's not going to let Max Landis kind of say anything. He's like, okay, I like that. I don't like that. But I like, it doesn't matter. Uh, Okay, that, that, that. Mary Sue. No, no, no. This, this, this. And then David Ayer is going to make the decision. (laughs) You know how many more police codes you're going to have to remember when you factor in fairies and orcs? Like, we're going to get into like the 10,000s now. That's why he had to make so many cop movies so then he could step (laughs) outside the box and and make it a little more complicated for us all right now it's time for buy or sell natasha's going to read off a couple more of these stories in the movie news and we are simply going to buy or sell it natasha what's first while audiences gear up for batman and superman to take center stage marvel's third movie in the captain america series civil war has been silently getting ready for their big show which is now only two short months away yesterday marvel released a number of promo images for the movie asking audiences to choose a side the image show teams team ups from both team cap and team iron man along with posters featuring iron man fighting captain america perry buy or sell these new promo images from captain america civil war I think I buy them for the most part, but when I'm looking at the lot, certain ones I would probably never want to hang up in my apartment or office, but then I see things like specifically that shot of of, uh, Captain America with the Team Iron Man stamp. I'm a big fan of marketing campaigns that kind of put you in the mix of things, and the fact that they're calling for you to, you know, pick either side, like what they did with the emojis on Twitter, that's the kind of marketing I like. So if it's the Team Iron Man versus Team Captain America type thing, I'm for it. Uh I'm a big buy for me. I love these images. I love the fact that, like you said, Perry, they're getting you involved in it, but I just, it looks ripped right out of the comics. I can't even tell that it's the actors that are Chris Evans or Robert Downey Jr. That's Captain America, man. That That's Tony Stark. Like, that seems to me, that's everything that I want from this movie. It, it just, it, tells the story like we had a couple we had a question a couple weeks ago as far as there's some of these p- posters out there that are just the faces and just like it doesn't really tell you anything about the movie this tells you everything about the movie even with scarlet witch when she's back there you know that she's going to be part of this film doing you know being a part of i, I think she's part of uh, cap's team 
I don't know whose team she's on yet. You guys probably know better than I do. But uh, but as far as I know, she's part of someone's team. I know she's going to be a big part. Just from that alone, we're going to see her really use her powers more. So um, I love, absolutely love these images. Mark? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to buy these posters and give one to Perry to replace the Transformers 4 one. <laughs> Greatly appreciate In her that. office right now. I mean, look, I'm, I'm kind of with Perry where I don't love everyone to the point where I would put it up on my wall. Some of them look more like they belong in a comic book than on a movie poster, which isn't necessarily, if that's the worst thing you can say about a poster, that ain't that bad. Some of these I really love, though. I just love the whose side are you on. I think it's yeah. a, that's everything you need to know about the movie is that you're walking into a theater, you just, let, you just saw a movie and you're coming out and you see Iron Man and Captain America and it's like oh wait there's oh my god they're fighting that's who you're trying to get we're already seeing this movie kids this is advertising to people who pay to see another movie they're walking out and they're like oh that movie looks cool and you're damn right it does I am so locked into this advertising campaign the detail on those are great I keep catching yeah. myself turning around and like staring at it for a while and then I'm like oh like cameras I'm on a show and it does yeah. give you some insight into who's going to be on whose team yeah, on that whose side are you on it does it's also smart to do it right in the middle of all the you know with politics right now and the election and everything mm -hmm. too it's it's smart to put that up there the way that they're doing it and and because of this huge storyline with civil war all right what's next harry potter author jk rowling took to twitter yesterday in order to clear up some concerns fans had about her wizarding universe post harry potter in her tweets she confirmed that this year's harry potter spin-off fantastic beasts and where to find them is the first movie in a planned trilogy with the first film essentially a first chapter of a larger story the movie with a screenplay by rowling is directed by potter alum david yates set 70 years before harry potter stepped foot in hogwarts the movie stars eddie redmayne as newt scamander Catherine Watterson as Perpentia Goldstein and Colin Farrell as Percival Graves. Fantastic Beasts will open this November 18th with the other two movies following in 2018 and 2020. Christian, buy or sell three movies in the Fantastic Beasts storyline. I'm going to buy it. I know it's not a huge book or set of novels the way Harry Potter was, but the fact that it's J.K. Rowling who's writing these scripts makes me say, okay, that she's going to have enough story and she's going to know the characters that we can trust in her to, that she's not just saying, hmm, I'm going to make Hobbit a trilogy. It's like, so it, there was no reason for Hobbit to be a trilogy. Hobbit should have been like either one big movie or two movies, that's it. But this, to me, I can buy because it means that she's really developing and just not putting them into novels. She's putting them into three screenplays. So I, I think that this works, so I'm going to buy it. Perry? I'm going to buy it because of her and because it's within the Harry Potter world because I cover a lot of young adult book to film adaptations and right now everyone is in the habit of spreading a book out over the course of multiple movies and I wouldn't say it's serving most of them well with the exception of maybe being Hunger Games but even in that they're too so Mockingjay is too so they're both good movies but you need to watch both in order to get the full picture and I think a movie needs to stand alone so the fact that they're selling this right now as the first chapter in a bigger story it could go one way or the other. It could have that same effect where it's unfortunate that, that you need to see all of them, that you can't appreciate a single story. But at the same time, as long as there is a satisfying mini narrative within that first film that then expands into something bigger over the course of three films, fine by me. So I buy it. The story here is more is, is less because we knew that they were going to do a trilogy. That yeah. was kind of already announced. It's it's more that this is kind of like the first chapter. and Yeah. This is this is a little more telling us about how they're formatting the screenplays more right. than anything. Yeah, J.K. Rowling's amazing, man. She can this is the same author that writes like 900 page books and can somehow give us all this information in a 140 character tweet but I liked it I dig the fact that it's a true we're gonna want to see more of these I'm telling you when this thing comes out it's gonna catch on like wildfire if you didn't know what Fantastic Beasts and where to find them was before you probably will be aware of it afterwards and plus this is not a Tolkien situation simply because J.K. Rowling's still alive like if she wants to come up with new right. stories or inject new life into whatever book she wrote she's allowed to do that this is not Peter Jackson going in reading a novel and some appendices and saying, I think we can squeeze three out of this. This is the author. This is the creator of the material saying, yes, there's definitely enough for a trilogy. So I tend to trust her. It also makes a big difference that this is going to be an original narrative. You're right. not taking this existing thing and trying to divide it up. She is like tailoring this story for this format. So that in itself could make all the difference here. And that she knows the world. Obviously, she's probably been thinking about this for a while. And I like that it's 70 years beforehand. She can kind of set some things up. And, and you know, in that way, if it doesn't, we have to be like, well, it's getting close to Harry Potter because you can still do in between whatever it's a 10 year span yeah 70 years is a great window yeah, it's, it's not perfect. like five years before when right. you hear a baby crying with a scar and you're right. like oh is that him right so there's, there's going to be some interesting things I'm, I'm actually really looking forward to when this movie hits in November alright Natasha what do we got next 
You would think Zack Snyder only has superheroes on his mind, what with Batman and Superman opening in a couple of weeks and a full schedule with Justice League, but not according to the folks over at Bloomberg Business. In speaking with them for an interview about Batman vs. Superman, Snyder revealed he has an idea for a movie based on George Washington in the style of 300. Snyder said he got the idea from a painting of Washington during the Revolutionary War that hangs in his office. Mark, would you buy or sell a movie about George Washington in the vein of 300. Yeah, sure. I'm up for a revolutionary train wreck. Let's do this thing, man. When I watch John Adams on HBO, I'm like, you know, this thing could really use more abs and swords and sandals. That's what I care about. Let's put it in George Washington. George Washington, by all accounts, was a badass. He was a great leader. He's fighting battles. It's a, it's an epic kind of battle scene you could have with that. So I actually am going to buy this in real life. Like, I think I would. Zack Snyder, we really got to see Batman versus Superman before we want this guy dealing with any other properties or real life events that we care about. But I just it sounds so ridiculous and silly, but there's I, I, there's been very few movies like the Patriot did it kind of well wh where you get those Revolutionary War battle scenes that feel like you're there. That's not saying that I felt like I was there at 300, but it's something that maybe we can relate to when you get a really neat battle scene. What's he going to do in between the battles? That's my big question. Yeah, I'm going to sell this. Uh, <laughs> it, it just it, it, he, he doesn't have Miller this time to do. You know, he did 300 with the first time, but I, I, I don't know. Uh, it, it you know based off a painting and then there might be a couple cool battle scenes that might work in that style 300 and and then what history you know what? professors are gonna hate it I, you let let steven spielberg do a george washington movie you know i don't want zack snyder to do a steven spielberg movie let him let him do i mean excuse me do a george washington movie let him let him do uh, the he's, he's got justice league on his plate he's trying to set up the dc universe i don't need him taking george washington and making it in a style 300 it sounds absolutely ridiculous to me i want nothing to do with this movie yeah i've definitely got hansel and gretel witch hunters on the brain today because if this movie was done in that style and it went like balls to the walls crazy i think i'd have some fun with it but like like the david ayer thing that's not snyder style so that wouldn't be what we're getting here but i'm just going to sell this because it's not happening this story <laughs> this story was buried in that bloomberg.com article like to the point where i could just picture the interviewer talking to him and this being like an afterthought oh Oh, like I remember that one time I saw that that image and I thought maybe I should make a movie about it but it's not happening because because of that and it's also not happening because he's busy with another big property right now it's just if this ever does happen it's going to be god knows how far down the line I mean listen I will say that there's something to be said that it, during the middle of these battles that if he shot those battles like they did in 300 for about 10 to 15 minutes or every time they did those battles it will look cool the guy can shoot action and make things look really really phenomenal i just i, I just don't want it i cause i don't think it would be as silly as like vampire hunter which when that movie was announced by the way berlin lincoln vampire hunter i was actually really excited about it because i heard great things about the novel and then and i thought it could be kind of a cool spin on it and it was it was this one of the stupidest movies that have been made in the last five years and one of the worst parts about that one is that it's an ugly movie too yeah. i feel like if Zack snyder did It'll this at sure, least sure. it would be gorgeous and like the visuals would just be like through the roof but yeah. no I, don't, I don't know hey, about but this. think about this though batman and superman are fighting so they're not going to be friends we're trying to form a justice league here who's the great leader George Washington, man, he's the new leader of the Justice League. Throw him in Justice League Part 1. You get all those superheroes and GW leading the way. I'm eager for the spoofs on this. Actually, wasn't yeah. there a robot chicken? Maybe. Where where they put uh, Washington into 300? Oh, God, that would have been great. Maybe that's where it I came feel, from. I feel like that, that, that does exist. Maybe that's where it came from. You never from. know. <laughs> all right. Now we are on to opening this week, brought to you by our friends over at AMC Theatres. Natasha, what is coming out this week that we should talk about? Zootopia is coming out this oh, yeah. week. From the largest elephant to the smallest shrew, the city of Zootopia is a mammal metropolis where various animals live and thrive. When Judy Hopps, voiced by Jennifer Goodwin, becomes the first rabbit to join the police force, she quickly learns how tough it is to enforce the law. Determined to prove herself, Judy jumps at the opportunity to solve a mysterious case. Unfortunately, that means working with Nick Wilde, voiced by Jason Bateman, a wily Fox who makes her job even harder. All right, Zootopia. We have actually, all three of us here have seen Zootopia. It is following up both Wreck It Ralph and Frozen and Big Hero 6. So Disney has gotten themselves back on track, obviously, in the last like what five, six years. Um, so would this one continue 
For me, the answer is yes, absolutely. I really enjoyed this movie. It has the moments that you want for little kids. It's got the moments that for adults. There's those jokes that you, at some point, and I think you guys agree with us, that you're watching this movie and going, that was really risky that they put that joke in there, but it works. It plays out. There are some moments that you feel, okay, I've seen this before. That's fine. But I thought the relationship between Judy Hopps and Nick Wilde, who voiced by Jason Bateman, by the way, and is the, some of the best voice casting in a very long time. It's a feel-good film. It's it's. I, I really enjoy what Disney did here. Yeah, I mean, you're right. Bateman was phenomenal. But I also, Jennifer Goodwin as uh, Judy Hopps, like, I cared about that goddamn bunny, right? Yeah. When I met it, I was like, oh, it wants to be a cop. Let it be a cop. I liked how you had, like, a home away from home feel at the beginning of the movie. And then you get into this huge metropolis with all these different animals. It's hysterical the way that they have animals evolve to the point when they're like us. They just have ordinary problems. that with their, They're going shopping. They're trying to stop crime. There's all these things happening, selling popsicles. And you're right, Christian. When Perry right. and I, we saw it together. We were walking out of the theater. We we're like, dude, there's a lot of humor in there that's going to go right over kids' heads. But it made us, there's drug humor in there, guys. Don't worry, your kids aren't <laughs> going to know, but we sure will. As cheesy as it sounds, this is like the ultimate fun for the whole family mm -hmm. film. Like, I'm already picturing my little cousins and their parents going to see it and everybody <laughs> loving it. As a horror lover, though, I was hooked. I'm not going to spoil it, but I was hooked by the first scene for obvious reasons, which you will see. Everything in this movie is just so insanely clever. And I had a similar reaction to this as I did to Inside Out where it's like, oh, the mind world, and we're going to personify emotions, but how are you going to build it? When I saw this and I saw how they divided up Zootopia in the different areas, like the different types of climates that animals live in, I'm like, all right, that makes for a pretty image, but how is that going to work? And they really like go into some pretty good detail with like just the world building and how people operate in Zootopia, and damn, that sloth scene. <laughs> like, I, I've seen that sloth scene in theaters like three or four times at this point, but in context in the movie, and they don't really change it in the movie, but I'm still, like when he opens his mouth so slowly to yeah. laugh I am just dying every time every, the way that they use the sloth in general not spoiling anything, there's a couple ways that they use them in the movie that was so it works and you're absolutely right it was the world building that got me because I felt like that what I didn't feel that the good dinosaur did you know with the in the beginning when the when the it misses the earth the kind misses the earth and the fact that it, it's it wasn't set up as well as this movie is and I thought that this movie was really charming I think you can go see it even if you're an adult like sometimes you feel a little weird you're going ah oh, it's a kid's movie I'm by myself I don't want to go freak the kids out you might end up freaking kids out but you're still going to enjoy being in the theater because this yeah. movie is good for kids or adults okay um before we move on Christopher Rise in the uh Christopher V I guess in the chat says that Perry was right about George Washington and Robot Chicken. It's called 1776. Oh, there you go. Hey. Sweet. Mm -hmm. fact. Speaking I knew something of, about Robot Chicken. There you go. <laughs> Speaking of you guys, what we're going to ask you guys to do is make sure that we're going to take some live tweets a little later. Start sending them in now. Natasha is the gatekeeper. So if you want to ask some questions, whether they are behind the scenes stuff, whether they are about any movie topics that you guys want to talk about, go ahead and send those in now. But it's also time for Mailbag. You guys have sent some stuff in. We have gone through them. Natasha, what are they saying? Bubba Kai writes, Aloha Collider Crew. Been a big fan since yesterday. The question <laughs> I, I have I love that. is about what happened to the hit movie song or soundtrack. Back in the 80s and 90s, you got a constant string of hit songs, soundtracks, and music videos that accompanied movies to help promote them. To this day, if I mention Simple Minds, Don't You Forget About Me, or Kenny Loggins' Danger Zone, or Lindsey Buckingham Holiday Road, you instantly know the film it comes from. It seems to me that the studio is missing out on a great promotion tool just wondering your thoughts thanks and keep up the great sweatness <laughs> Mark, why don't you, you're the big soundtrack guy. Yeah. Let's I, hit it. I want to hang out with Bubba, man. He's got good taste in music. And look, I think a lot of the reason why you don't see this stuff anymore is because when you turn on MTV, you don't see music videos. Like, music videos are just not used at all anymore. Maybe occasionally a band will release something, or you'll see a tag at the end of a kid's movie, like Zootopia with Shakira. But it's very few and far between, whereas beforehand, you're right, it was a great promotional tool. We, I mean, uh, producer Jonathan were back there talking before the show about all these great videos that we saw, particularly in the 80s and 90s when we were growing up, that it's like, oh, I want to go see that movie now. And a lot of them were like mid-90s, a few in the late 90s, then they really started to dry up. Like the ones that really stand out to me were I that Brian Adams, everything I do for Robin Hood was 
everywhere, man. I was also a huge, not only Young Guns 2 fan, but Bon Jovi fan when he did that soundtrack with Blaze of Glory. The most recent one I could think of off the top of my head was Mission Impossible 2 when Metallica did I Disappear and they did that music video, which ended up being a lot better than Mission Impossible 2. I would say Drive was a pretty good one as mm -hmm. well, too. Drive had a good um, soundtrack, but I think that there's there's a bunch of... They don't do it the way they used to because also the way that we listen to music has changed dramatically as well, mm -hmm. too. And there was that promotional tool back in the day, the way that they would use soundtracks, that, and they would also use those videos to, to sell the movie. They don't do it the same way now. So it's definitely... I. For me, it's funny. I, I pick out scores for movies more than I do soundtracks. But Perry, why do you think it's changed? At this point, I'm buying more scores than soundtracks. But I mean, the game has just completely changed. The only one that I could think about using a soundtrack as a selling tool, recently at least, is, is Twilight and mm. Hunger Games, like when Lord curated it. Like that was a big selling tool. Like, you know, here we're going to sample the soundtrack and make you want to see the movie. But the problem with that is none of the songs were then in the movie or maybe they were just all in the credits and I got up and left too quickly. But it's not like it used to be. Like the ones that come to my mind are movies like Can't Hardly Wait and Empire Records. I can listen to that soundtrack all the way through and Scream too. I could listen to those soundtracks all the way through and picture when it comes up in the movie. And that was the pleasure I used to get out of listening to soundtracks. Yeah, I mean, there were even there were, there were songs that were used in movies that were songs before the movie came out, but then you identify them with that film. Like it, sometimes you get teased with it and it never happens. Remember the movie Take Me Home Tonight? Had a great soundtrack. You know what it didn't have? Eddie Money, are you kidding me? The one that I think of sometimes is I'm a huge Van Halen fan. Panama, it comes on. I'm usually rocking out. And occasionally I'll think of that parking lot scene in Superbad when they're just driving around the cop car and shooting stuff. So that's, yeah. as, that's as far recent as I can get. Um, some great, great suggestions and, and examples here of some good soundtracks from the fans here. You got Guardians of the Galaxy, which was a really good one. That, they, and they, that was part of the storyline. Right. was the soundtrack. Yeah. That's awesome probably mix. one of the best examples. Deadpool recently was one. And Frozen. Frozen was a big, I mean, that, that yeah. those Disney movies, man, they'll all, yeah. they, they just get inside your soul. Yeah. There's nothing you can do. That's about. true. So those are a lot of great examples out there. There's Thank a good you Frozen joke in Zootopia. There is. There there's is. a great, there's, there's yeah. two Frozen jokes in Zootopia. Yeah, I'll have to tell You've you. You've seen that movie like hundreds of times. Zootopia? No, no, no. Frozen. Frozen. Yeah, my daughter, it's my daughter's favorite right nah, now. before you had a daughter, you saw the movie a bunch, dude. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> All right, Natasha, what's next? Dominic Santos writes, Hey, Collider crew, is there a remake of Cliffhanger still in development? It's one of my favorite action movies of all time. I think Dwayne Johnson would be the first and only choice for the lead and Michael Shannon for the villain role. <laughs> I think it would be the right movie to shoot in IMAX. What do you think of a remake of this classic 1993 film being made with these actors? Keep up the great work. I mean, I know that they were talking about it for a while, but we haven't heard. I mean, we're talking to Perry about it. Collider.com hasn't reported on it, what, like two years? Two years. Yeah, so it's been there's, a while. there's no, there's, there's <laughs> nothing <laughs> brewing right now. But what I would say, as far as your suggestions, The Rock and Michael Shannon, I dig that. That's a, that's a cool fun. Because there was, we, we, Mark and I just actually just talked about this, like the top five, we were doing like the top five diehard uh, ripoffs, and Cliffhanger was like number five, I think. Mm -hmm. And die that, hard on a mountain, man. Die hard on a cliff. Yeah, it, it for me that movie. It's it's got a, there's a lot of fun. It's got campiness too. And if you have Dennis has a fear of heights and it scares the crap out of him when you mention it. <laughs> but it's uh, and I thought it was one of Stallone at that time. Stallone was kind of up and down with films, and that one kind of gave him another hit under his belt. But I think that it could be. Uh, that's a movie that I could see having a remake and a warranted remake as where it's like. Point Break, when they announced it, when they're like, okay, Gerard Butler's going to play Bodie, I'm like, okay, I can see that. And then they wound up making it for in a ridiculous amount of money and it shouldn't happen. But um, this is one I could see happening. And I love those suggestions. Perry, what do you think? For a hot second, I entertain this idea yeah. just because of Sylvester, Sylvester Stallone right now and his run in the awards campaign. But like, really, I mean, Point Break, not only was it not a good movie, but it did really poorly. And then you can go back to Everest, which is a great movie, and it didn't do well in theaters either. So I think the time for extreme sports movies is not right now. You don't think stars can help that, though? Because you look at something like Point Break, who's in that movie? And and like Ever uh, Luke Bracey. <laughs> <laughs> right, but it's like, so it... it I, I, and because they didn't even have the, the the whole point of Point Break was the surfing and it's like an element of it in the remake it was just handled so poorly like with a great cast and you look know look at Everest though 
Everest has a killer cast, and just nobody went to see that movie. And it was also a great, great movie. It was a, good it was a really yeah. good movie as well. It was. It was yeah. a really good one. I mean, but, look, I would, I would totally be into this, but like again, you got to sell it with the stars because nobody saw Point Break in large part because they didn't know why they needed yeah. to see another Point Break, and because nobody was in it that really like gets you out. There's some good actors in the movie, but nobody that gets you out of bed in the morning. But The Rock and Michael Shannon is like the villain. I just don't think you. I, I think that it actually would hurt a movie like this. You're going to do a mountain action movie with The Rock and Michael Shannon. Just make a mountain action movie with those guys. Don't rest on the cliffhanger laurels, which I'm not really sure you want to get into. Like, like, are there that many people that are like, God, why haven't they made a cliffhanger sequel yet? Like, just make another cool mountain right. movie. We don't have to do it. No, I agree. Okay, now it's time for live tweets. You guys have been sending stuff in to... Collider video at Collider video. Natasha has been going through them. Natasha, what are they saying out there? All right. Dujin Pizakshin asks, do you consider Batman versus Superman and Captain America Civil War twin films? I'd like to hear your thoughts. Um, I wouldn't say twin films because uh, no, I think because even though Man of Steel has essentially set up the DC Cinematic Universe, they're this one is they're really riding on this one to further along and set things off and put things into motion. And it's a it's it, just because Batman is fighting Superman for what we think is going to be maybe in the first half of the film, and then they're going to patch up their differences and fight Doomsday and do other things too. The storyline and the basis of what Civil War seems to be is that these two groups are going up against one another, and if they are fighting against somebody else, we don't know that yet. Right now, it seems like two factions that are going up against one another. So, no, I don't see them as twin films. Do you? I mean, you got to be very careful when you mention twins too, because twins they look the same when it's from a distance. Then you get up close and you realize one of them's crazy, right? Rondé Barber's totally normal. Tiki Barber's a nutcase, okay? So, like when you see this movie, it's like, oh, they're fighting each other over here. Oh, they're fighting each other too. When you get closer one of these twins might be crazy i hope it's not either one i hope it's just a nice fraternal or paternal which is the one where they were born at the same time but they don't look like each other fraternal. That, that's fraternal yeah. twins i think these are fraternal twins not yeah. paternal twins I like this phrase, uh, twin films. I can't wait until that becomes like the next thing. Like, right. forget cinematic universes. Let's make twin films. <laughs> That's going to be a disaster. Yeah. But I mean, I can see that phrase applying to these movies when you look at those posters, for example, mm -hmm. and they kind of do look the same. And like the promotional campaigns sell the movies in a mildly similar manner. But when we see these two things in full, I have a feeling that they are going to be very, very different. Like your analogy there. Oh, thank you very much. The fraternal <laughs> twins thing that really hooked the viewers at home. Um, <laughs> we have we have a message. Um, from one of the YouTube viewers right right now okay. that uh, goes by the name of John Campia who okay. says uh, Mark it is 90 degrees in Burbank take off your leather jacket but then I wouldn't be kicking as much ass Campia oh yeah but yeah. John <laughs> but John hey you know what Campia I have pride in my leather jacket make sure you pick out the pride on Amazon right now oh. <laughs> what's next <laughs> Ishraki asks over or under, what do you think the chances are for Batman versus Superman beating Star Wars The Force Awakens opening weekend record? Look, man, I would if you had asked me that a couple of days ago, I would have told you, I don't think it's going to have a chance, um, but the pre-sales are doing pretty well. I still don't think it's going to do it because I think that the time, it's only about, I think, 15 minutes longer than The Force Awakens, but that, that counts. It, and it also, I don't think it's in nearly as many screenings that uh, they're not having as many screenings as force awakens does so do i think that it'll catch its opening weekend no but i would not be shocked if it cracks 200 i still have it at about 100 and i see 80 I say 180 for batman v superman opening weekend but um would i be shocked if it beat it no, I just don't think it's going to happen. That's a big number. Is that is that the projected right now? It was. I feel like I saw 120. No, it was projected. They were projecting at about 160 or so. Oof. That's. I mean, that's a big number, yeah. but I don't think it's it's going to beat it. Mainly because when I assess the potential of a movie like this, I think of my family, and they're not really into superhero movies, and they're not really into you know Star Wars. But whereas my parents wanted to go see Star Wars. I can guarantee you there is no chance they're going to go see Batman v mm. Superman. <laughs> so I think that Star Wars will have the edge for that reason. Mark? Uh, look, if you're talking about opening weekend numbers, I'll tell you that if Batman v Superman beats Star Wars opening weekend, I will do the show in this leather jacket and nothing else. 
<laughs> there's no way in hell that that thing is going to beat Star Wars opening weekend. It's a juggernaut. We're not going to see those numbers probably from future Star Wars films for a while. So I'm excited as anybody to see Batman v Superman. It's just not going to beat Star Wars opening weekend. All right, what's next? <laughs> All right, Abigail asks, Hi, have you heard that Suicide Squad 2 is going into production in 2017? Is this a good sign for Suicide Squad? Uh, you were nodding your head. Did you hear this already? I did, like right before we actually came on oh, set. Okay. I was scrolling through Twitter and I saw it there and I got all pumped. Okay. Uh, of course this is a good thing because I I assume this means that they have tested some of the footage and the WB execs are happy with it and they are ready to push forward. And based on what I've seen so far, it looks like I'm going to want a lot more, so I'm glad they're jumping into it fast. Yeah, I mean, I, you would assume it's a good thing if the, for the reasons that you're saying is that, that they've screened it, they think that people are liking it and that they can really do some more stuff with it and obviously there's more story to tell. So if this is the case, but the only thing to also take into consideration is that they announced Fantastic Four 2 right away. Oh when I, I'm not saying this movie is going to be another Fantastic Four. I think the, the, exactly the opposite. But it doesn't necessarily mean right off the bat that this is a great movie. It just means that they're trying to build franchises, which I understand. So just because they're setting it, let's not get too excited yet. Yeah, you can always pull the plug on something if it really stinks opening weekend, but I think that Suicide Squad is going to be one of those movies that regardless, let's say that Batman versus Superman isn't what we all want and it's not a good movie at all. Even if that's the case, I think that the advertising job and the one that they will do from now until August is going to be separating those two films enough to where it's not going to have a stink of a bad movie if that is the case on it too much. Yes, Batman's involved in both of them, but people might want to see Batman and Suicide Squad if they didn't get the Batman they wanted in Batman v Superman. So yeah, go ahead and get the wheels in motion because it's a huge tentpole project. We want to see more stories in this universe probably. So just in case the movie kicks ass, let's see some more. All right, Natasha, let's do two more. All right, this one's kind of funny. Justin Reese asks, hey, love the show. My question is, do you ever think we will get a She-Hulk movie? In the spirit of these all women guys. Yeah. The, funny, the funny thing is we've been asked that before and as of right now, no. I don't think it's going to happen at all. Um, that's not to say it won't happen in 10, 15, 20 years from now. Who knows where the universe is going to go and maybe once we finish the Avengers, the, the next Infinity War, that it could happen, but I don't think it can happen. I think there's a good chance because Brigitte Nielsen's calendar has never been leaner. I mean, she is ready to work. She she was going to be She-Hulk in the in the 80s. You think a standalone She-Hulk movie? She was going to be She-Hulk in the 80s. No, I just want to see Brigitte Nielsen do anything again. <laughs> but she she was that was like a real movie that was greenlit, and there were, maybe it was even made. I can't remember, but they saw her in Rocky IV, and they were like, this has got to be our She-Hulk. So, But if her in 1987 or whenever they were going to make that movie can't get that movie off the ground, right. I got a okay. hard time imagining that you're going to be able to do She-Hulk with anybody. It doesn't matter matter if it's a more modern actress it's just going to be a hard flick to pull off yeah i don't see this happening especially anytime soon and i think they're going to do it with characters that they've kind of already introduced or at least teased or talked about a little bit before this one gets their own standalone movie and let's let's give the hulk another standalone movie before mm -hmm. we give she hulk one for now but it also looks like the hulk man and like i don't know what the hulk and she hulk's history is I, I don't know that they even like date i think that she's just another of that kind of species but the hulk has a, some romantic interest already on team avengers so if that that's the way the storyline goes, then just hands off She-Hulk. He's already dealing with stuff. Someone wrote R-rated She-Hulk. Uh, <laughs> You'd have to do it R-rated, right? She, yeah. She's ripping limbs off everybody. No, but just, she gets so much bigger, she's wearing a tight shirt probably anyway. Just to explode. There's going to be boobs everywhere. Just don't have a oh sex scene between She-Hulk and regular Hulk. They did in Deadpool. No thanks. <laughs> <laughs> it's so awkward. Uh, all right, what's next? Okay. <laughs> Let me just get those images out of my mind. I think I would watch this He's movie. watching. Oh, she oh, hold boob. <laughs> <laughs> Rob Trinidad asks, today is my birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Do you think Leo DiCaprio will ever pursue in directing now that he has an Oscar? You guys are awesome. Um, you know, I feel like Steve asked this question to him in oh. a junket recently. He did, actually. Yes, did he? he did. Yes, yeah. so watch, you're right. Watch um, watch Frosty, Steve Weintraub's interview with uh, on, when it was for The Revenant between him and Tom Hardy. He actually asked him that question. I think, Yeah, yeah. I think it was that one. And uh, I think his answer was very middle of the road. I imagine that would be his next step. I mean, now that he's got his Oscar, he's got to move on to something else. So <laughs> I, I wouldn't be surprised if we found out that he was directing something at right. some point in the near future. Okay, everyone's yelling at me because the Hulk 
Hulk and She-Hulk are cousins. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Wait. They're cousins, you weirdo! <laughs> it's not the fact that I was talking about two Hulks having uh, sex together. It was the fact that they were cousins, too. I was, was talking a- about them having... I'm from the South. Look, you can do whatever you want in the Hulk universe, <laughs> and it's fine by me. You know what? Let's have let's have a legitimate name. What we need to do with this what Hulk in the middle project... Of it? This is wrong. You're getting way too excited, Mark. We need to get a A-list director, maybe somebody who could use his clout in Hollywood to get this movie made. Who better than Leonardo DiCaprio? Oh my his first God. movie is going to be directing a She-Hulk film. Boom! They're cousins! <laughs> oh my God. Uh, what? Uh, yeah, Leo directing would be interesting, but I think I remember Frosty's interview and he didn't seem like he wanted to do it right now. The dude is a phenomenal producer, and I think that his head is in producing as well, too. Um, and he should be, because all this... There are some movie stars that have tried to do production companies and other stuff, and just their heads aren't in it or they don't have the business sense that he does he's got from everything that I hear about him too and from what we've seen from him the stuff that he's pro- producing Appian Way is his, mm-hmm. is his company he is a phenomenal producer I want to see him continue to do that and, and act, he'll be acting for a very long time I mean are they first cousins or is it like a second is it loose at That's all? a valid question yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's do this will be the last one <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Justin Marquez asks, what is the origin story of how Ellis met Christian? How did you guys meet? Okay, so uh, there you go. I was dating a She-Hulk at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and um, realized it was his cousin, so he yeah. stopped. I, well, Christian was already out in L.A. He was uh, he landed on Plymouth Rock first, and then I moved out to L.A. Uh, over a decade ago, and we met doing stand-up comedy, and that was kind of our thing, and then we hung out. Then Christian uh, produced a pilot called Grasping at Straws, and he made the horrifically dumb decision of casting me in one of the very small roles in it and then we kind of hung out some more we discovered a mutual love for movies and then we said hey what's that YouTube thing yeah, and we started doing YouTube, but you actually see, you want to see Ellis, can I, can I tell him what we used to call you? Or you used to call yourself? Uh, no, you cannot. All right, fine. No. All right, fine. Oh. Uh, well, I'm going to ask about this after. It was fine. Hulk. Fine, but if you want to go and you see Ellis in Grasping at Straws, that's up online now. You but see yeah, a whole we, lot more of Ellis. Yeah, we, we just, it was funny because from the comedy store, and then we just, we started reviewing movies, I think, in uh, like 2007 and created Schmoes No in 2008. And here we are today. All right, guys, that's it for Movie Talk. Thank you guys so much for joining us. I'd like to thank our panel. First of all, Perry Nemiroff, where can they find you? You guys can catch me at P. Nemiroff on Twitter and Instagram. And Mark Ellis, who we won't say what we used to call you, where can they find you? You guys can find me and all my preferred authorized nicknames <laughs> at Mark Ellis Live. Some bad news and some good news. I'm not going to be in Chicago in a couple weeks. I'm sorry I had to cancel the date, but the good news is I had to cancel it because we have so many cool things we're producing right here. They need me in town. I'm happy to be on board. There's a lot of good Schmodown matches coming our way. And the lady with the best shirt on the internet, where can they find you? Oh, yeah. You guys can find me on Instagram <laughs> and Twitter at Natasha Lexus underscore. And for me, you can find me at Christian Harloff, Twitter and Instagram, and a couple of things before we take off. Obviously, you know, we mentioned that we have TV talk. That's coming up pretty soon. We'll have some more information on that. We know Walking Dead is back. We have a great interview. Mark's going to be talking to Angela Bassett from London Has Fallen. That will be coming up tomorrow. Make sure you check that out. And then we got the Ultimate Schmodown, the movie trivia contest. It's coming soon. And how about John Campia versus Screen? Green Junkies, Dan Merle, that is going to be a barn burner. Waiting for a confirmation date on it. It's coming soon. So just to let you guys know, and obviously check out Jedi Council today. Myself, Mark Ellis, John Campia, and Tiffany Smith. We will be talking Star Wars. You guys should join us, and you should join us tomorrow on Movie Talk. Thanks. Great. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.